We're going to, I'm going to preach for a few minutes this morning. Second Kings chapter six. Second Kings chapter six. I'm picking up at verse 8. I'm going to read uh, through verse 14, then we're going to pause, and then we're going to read in verses 15 through 17, and pause there, and then cover 18 through 23. Watch what happens in verses 8 through 14. Now the king of Aram was at war with Israel. Now, i got to pause there a minute. Do you remember what happened last time? Do you, do you remember that? If you go back, if you, or maybe it was two times ago, I don't know. But if you go back, look at chapter 5, verse 1. Now Naaman was commander of the army of the king of Aram. What did God do for Naaman? He healed him. He healed Naaman, the, the king of Aram, or Syria, the enemies of Israel. Interesting. Interesting. So let's go back. See, see, read this now and listen to it. Now, now the king of Aram was at war with Israel. After conferring with his officers, he said, I will set up my camp at such and such a place. The man of God sent word to the king of Israel, beware of passing that place because the, the Arameans are going to go down there. So the king of Israel checked on the place, indicated by the man of God. And time and time, again, Elisha warned the king so that he was on his guard in such places. This enraged the king of Aram. He summoned his officers and demanded of them, Tell me, which one of us is on the side of the king of Israel? None of us, my lord, the king, said one of his officers. But, but Elisha, the prophet who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the very word you speak in your bedroom. Go find out where he is, the king ordered, so I can send men and capture him. The report came back. He is in Dothan. Then he sent horses and chariots and a strong force there. They, they went by night and surrounded the city. You know, we use words like um, military intelligence. We talk about spies and spying. We talk about espionage. We talk about counterintelligence. We talk about all these different things that, that our, our military uses to get the advantage, to get the inside information. And quite frankly, even though we know very little of what's going on, we're glad that it happens. We're glad that there are people doing this, and we hope that they can prevent wars, and we hope that they can prevent catastrophes and attacks. We're glad that some of these things go on. But I don't care how well you do it. It certainly doesn't compare to what's going on here. This is, every time they plan something, the Lord whispers in Elisha's ear, go tell the king this is what they're up to. Now that's a pretty good defense, wouldn't you think? Say yes. I, 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 it, yes, yes. That's a really good defense. And so that's what's going on. They're using as much military intelligence as they can. They're planning and spying and doing everything they can. They're trying to get the advantage. But God whispers in Elisha's ear and blows the whole thing up over and over again. I love it. I love it. The king wants to know what's going on. There must be a traitor in our group. There must be a traitor. Someone, someone's giving us away. Someone's talking. Someone, someone's letting them know. And it seems like so often the leader is either the first to know or the last to know. I can agree with that entirely. Sometimes I, I believe I'm the first to know, and sometimes I know I'm the last to know. But this time, the king is the last to know. But somebody, somebody does know. Somebody speaks up, and he says, You don't have any traitors here. There are no traitors among your men here. We, we are not traitors. But here's the deal, king. Every time you make plans, every time you guys sit around that boardroom, every time you decide what you're going to do, every time you share the ideas, somehow this prophet of Israel, that they may know that there's a prophet in Israel, remember that from before? This prophet in Israel, he knows. He knows. He knows what you're up to. He knows what you're going to do. And the king thinks this is awful 
How, how, how can we go to war if every time that I make plans that this guy knows what I'm going to do and, and, and foils my plans? What we need to do is we need to make a plan to foil his plans. Now, does one or two of you here think that maybe this is an exercise in futility? Do you think maybe this is just a bad idea? This guy is one step ahead of you all the time because the Lord God Almighty is saying what's going on. Don't you think even as they sit around this table and say, let's make plans to capture this Elisha, that maybe Elisha is not losing a night's sleep about the whole thing. It's crazy good. So what happens? They make the plans. They make the plans. They get on their horses. They go. They're going to go to Dothan where uh, Elisha is, and they're going to surround the city, and they are going to surround him. They are going to get the upper hand. Uh Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So watch this. Verse 15. 15 through 17, the heart of this passage. The Naaman... And all his attendants, hold it, hold it, I turned to the wrong chapter. My apologies. There you go. Verse, uh, picking up at verse 15 now. When the servant of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh no, my Lord. What shall we do, the servant asked. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed, open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots and fire all around Elisha. Things are not always as they seem. Remember that. Things are not always as they seem. Lots of times we say we see in black and white, but we need to see in full color. Well, I guess we see in full color, but we see the visible world in front of us, but we do not see the world that is just as real, that is unseen. It is very real. Things are not always as they seem. I could take a real easy illustration for you. All of us probably at one point or another have been followers of a certain sports team or a sports event or whatever. Some of us are big followers of it. Some of us small. But there's always been one of those games. There's always been one of the games when, when one team is a severe underdog. You know, everybody just knows the other team is going to win. You can take some of the Super Bowls when, when there's betting on that, which you don't need to do. And they bet on those Super Bowls, and, and like almost everybody is betting on one team. They're sure that this team is going to win. It's going to, be a, uh, it's going to be a slaughter. It's not even going to be close. But you watch the game, and something happens. Maybe it's your Super Bowl, not the Super Bowl, but, 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 but you play the game, and something unexpected happens. It doesn't go as you think it's going to go. Things aren't always as they seem. Just because they have the bigger, the quicker, the swifter ones, it doesn't mean that this is going to end the way you think it's going to end. Things aren't always as they seem, and you don't always see what's really going on. Things aren't always as they seem. But I can show you something much bigger than that, much more important than that. In fact, I'm going to. I want you to listen to this. Things aren't always as they seem. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. 
The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and went up to him again and again, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they slapped him in the face. Once more, Pilate came out and said to the Jews gathered there, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, Here's the man. As soon as the chief priests and their officials saw him, they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! But Pilate answered, You take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against this man. The Jews, Jewish leaders insisted, We have a law concerning, to, uh, according to the law, he must die because he has claimed to be the Son of God. When Pilate heard this, listen, when Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid, and he went back inside the palace. Where do you come from, he asked Jesus, but Jesus gave him no answer. Do you refuse to speak to me, Pilate said? Now listen, 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 listen. Things are not always as they seem. Don't you realize I have power either to free you or to crucify you? Pilate, where in the world are you? Things are not what you seem, what you think they seem to be. Things are not always as they seem. And here's the second thing. Sometimes we just don't see. We don't always see what God is doing. The fascinating thing is, if you go to, say, uh, John chapter 9, there's this bashing of, of heads, so to speak. And Jesus is talking to the leaders. They are the spiritual leaders of the day. These are the guys who are supposed to know everything. They're supposed to know the scriptures inside and out. They are the ones who are supposed to be leading the people toward God. They, they've got it going. And Jesus is talking with them. And Jesus says to them, You're blind. You who are supposed to be the closest to God, you can't see. You say, we've got the scriptures. Yes, you do. You've got the Bible right smack dab in front of you, but you don't understand it. You don't get it. You don't believe in me. You've got hard hearts. You can't see the truth. Sometimes people are ever so close. They're right there. And they're still spiritually blind. Sometimes people are so close, you would think. They're so close to the church. They're so close to other believers. They're so close, but they still can't see. Oftentimes, that's the way it is. It's not just those outside the church doors and distant who can't see, and, and, and a lot of them cannot see, too. But sometimes it happens with us. Sometimes we don't see more than meets the eye. And for some reason, sometimes we don't always realize with God all things are possible. We can't, but God can. God can do far more than we ask or imagine. God can. Open his eyes. Open his eyes so he can see. Open his eyes so he can know that God is not a weak God and God is not a distant God and God is not a powerless God, but God is an ever-present help in the time of trouble. God is a God who is here and God is with us and God makes things happen and he is not weak. Open up our eyes, Lord. No, the truth is, I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't pull it off. But with God, all things are possible. And we've got to believe the possibilities that God wants to work in and through us. Open our eyes, Lord, that we can see. 
You know, I'd like to say that's just a prayer for people who are out on the mission field praying that these people who never heard about Jesus before in their lives, that God will open up their eyes to enable them to believe in Jesus. Yes, it's a prayer for them. But it's a prayer for every single one of us that we keep praying that prayer, Lord, to open our eyes so that we can see what God is doing in this world and so that we don't give up and just go through the motions and just live our lives and just don't do anything. Open our eyes, Lord, so that we can see what you are calling us to do, so that we can do everything that you call us to do through Jesus Christ. And that is far more than we'll ever know. Sometimes we just don't see. There's another surprise here. So where were we? We went through uh, 17, was it? I've got to go back. I'm in the wrong book. Second Kings 17. I'm in the right book, the wrong uh, book within the book. So <laughs> Second Kings 6, thank you. And we're at about at verse 18, is that right? There we are, thank you. As the enemy came down toward him, Elisha prayed to the Lord, strike this army with blindness. So he struck them with blindness as Elisha had asked. Elisha told him, this is not the road and this is not the city. Follow me and I will lead you to the man you are looking for. And he led them to Samaria. Samaria, right, right to the heart of Israel, right? Uh, after they entered into the city, Elisha asked, or said, Lord, open the eyes of these men so they can see. And when the Lord opened their eyes, they looked. And there they were inside Samaria. Now watch this. When the king of Israel saw them, he asked Elisha, Shall I kill them, my father? Shall I kill them? Here they are, these prisoners of war. They're, they're brought completely helpless into the middle of Israel's camp. They're surrounded by Israel's warriors at this point. The king's eyes light up. Can I kill them? Can I kill them? Let me kill them. Did I kill them, he answered. Would you kill those who have captured, you have captured with your own sword or bow? Set food and water before them so that they may eat and drink and then go back to their master. So he prepared a great feast for them. And after they had finished eating and drinking, he sent them away and returned to their master. So watch what happens. Watch this, watch this. So the bands from Aram stopped raiding Israel's territory. God's mighty action brings about reconciliation. So here is the king. Let's keep on fighting. Let's make a bloodbath here. And God says, uh-uh. Uh-uh. My way leads to peace, to shalom. And if you talk about the possibilities and the great things that God is doing, we want to see his peace and his shalom come from us too. And so you read in the New Testament, you read about that bloody cross. You can hardly imagine that God used such a thing to have his own son executed, but he did. But he did it in order that he might bring peace and reconciliation might come. It's come in part. And many of you have been reconciled to God through your faith in Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ paid the price because God did it all. You believe God has reconciled you to him. And there's still a whole lot of people out there who need to hear that message and be reconciled to God through Jesus. And there is a world, and that's what it talks about in the New Testament. God wants to reconcile all things to him through the cross. I know we're a far cry from it in this world of ours, in this world of increasing violence, both within our borders and beyond our borders, but the goal of the cross that will be fulfilled in God's grand new day is that that peace is going to come. Reconciliation will happen. God will create a whole new world. 
that's not here yet. But we are called to allow the Lord God Almighty to open up our eyes to see what we can do for that coming kingdom. God wants to use you where you are. He wants to send you on your way. He wants you to make the difference in this world with that news of Jesus Christ which changes everything. Look, it's impossible. Open our eyes, Lord. Open our eyes so that we can see what you have done and what you will yet do. Open our eyes. Open my eyes. May we see you and what you are doing. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for what you have done. And we thank you for what you are doing. When I open my eyes, Lord, it seems like I see a world which is out of control. I see a world of sin and especially violence. I see harsh words and I see bad things happening. I see a world that looks so chaotic. But Lord, open our eyes so we can see you, so that we can see clearly you are not done. You are still doing far more than we ask or imagine. Lord, let us see. Let us see, let us see. Let us see you at work. And may some of that work, Lord, be in us and through us. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen.